Very nice to be here. This is the first time I've ever been stopped in Falkirk. I've gone through it on the train often enough, but I've never stopped here before. And it's nice to have the opportunity to do so. What I want to talk about this evening, as was said, is the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And I'm going to focus particularly on Proverbs, but I want to bring out a number of features so that when we read these passages of the Old Testament, we'll be able to do so with greater understanding, with a, I hope, slightly different slant on what's being said. I've said wisdom literature. What are we talking about? Well, we're certainly talking about the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, a book like Ecclesiastes. You can stretch the definition a bit further. Some people would include Lamentations because it's written in a style that's very similar to some of the other wisdom books. You can include the Song of Solomon. Quite a number of people do that as well. And there are some Psalms also that are wisdom psalms. We've just been singing one of them, Psalm 1 itself. But what puts all these together? What is it that makes them stand apart? Well, one of the features of these parts of the Old Testament is what is not there. When you look and compare these books with the rest of the Old Testament, there's no mention of a great many themes. Throughout the Old Testament, you find time and again mention being made of how God in history led his people, of how he made a covenant with them, of how he gave promises to them, promises of the land, promises of a Messiah, promises of what was going to happen hereafter. As you read the book of Proverbs, there's no mention of that. There's no mention of Israel as a nation to any great extent. There's no mention of the many themes that you find in the history of the Old Testament or even in the prophets. For many people, that's one of the problems. For many scholars, that's one of the problems of, of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. How to link it in to everything else that's there. But that isn't an insuperable problem well, once you approach the wisdom literature from the right angle. The favorite angle of approaching it nowadays is to say, oh, look at all the surroundings. It is an international literature. If you look at the ancient world, it's not just in Israel that people had proverbs. It's not just there that you find people like Job wondering why the righteous suffer. It's not just there you find people like Ecclesiastes, the preacher, wondering just what is the... So there are some people who say, well, the way to understand these books is to see them as part of this international movement. And sometimes there are proverbs, there are parts of the book of Proverbs that are, are very similar to things, say, that you find in Egyptian literature. In part of Proverbs from chapter 22, verse 17, through quite a number of the following chapters till nearly the end of chapter 24, it's headed in the NIV, Sayings of the Wise. Many of these sayings are paralleled very closely in a piece of literature that was written by an Egyptian, an Egyptian civil servant. He was in charge of um, the work that was going on in certain areas of um, land registration of all things in Egypt. And he wrote extensively for his son how he could become a successful civil servant as well. But differences from the wisdom of the nations that really strike home. The parallels that exist in the pagan literature, they do exist. But there are a few things among a great many pieces of unwisdom 
mention of demons and pagan gods and the immorality that was sanctioned at pagan temples. They're all wrapped up into it. There was also in the literature of Egypt, the wisdom literature of Egypt, an elitism. For instance, there was that scribe I mentioned. What was one of the things he said? He said to his son, Be a scribe that your limbs may be smooth and your hands languid, that you may go out dressed in white, being exalted so that the courtiers salute you. How to be a successful civil servant in ancient Egypt. Now, there's nothing like that in the book of Proverbs. Nothing like the sort of one class of people are intrinsically superior to the others. There's a different tone. And it all comes back. Solomon is shown in Scripture to have been at the centre of wisdom literature. And can I read a passage from 1 Kings? 1 Kings chapter 4 and at verse 29, where we have a description of Solomon, his activities, and the origin of these books. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, including Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, Kalkal, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs numbered a thousand and five. He described plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also taught about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his fame. There was an intellectual renaissance in Solomon's day. His kingdom had expanded greatly, and Solomon enjoyed peace throughout his reign, and he cultivated wisdom. The sayings of Proverbs stretched further than that. It went into to natural wisdom as well. And people flocked to Solomon's court, bringing wisdom from north and south and east and west. And Israel was quite happy to accept many of those wisdom sayings they brought. In the book of Proverbs itself, you find the, the sayings of Agur in, in Proverbs chapter 30, and the teachings of Lemuel's mother in chapter 31, and both of these people seem to have been non-Israelites. Indeed, even the book of Job. Job came from the land of Uz. As best we can tell, Uz was near, but not in, Palestine. So these people flocked to listen to Solomon, and they brought with them their own wisdom. But Solomon didn't just adopt their wisdom. He analyzed it, and he purified it against the standards of the word of the Lord. There was much that could be accepted in the wisdom of the world. There was truth in the wisdom of the other nations because of common grace. God still works in terms of the insight and knowledge and capacity he gives to people, even those who are in rebellion against him, so that they can come to understanding of this world, this universe that we're in. But for all Till that wisdom had been taken and scrutinized in the light. Of the revelation that had been directly given in. And when that happened, 
the nature of wisdom changed. One thing that pervades an Israel's wisdom literature and makes it quite different from that of the surrounding nations is the note of certainty. I mentioned that in Babylon there was someone who underwent experiences similar to that of Job. And towards the end of the record he made of his experiences of suffering that he couldn't understand, he left, he ended perplexed as to which God to follow, as to whether he really could ever find out what that God wanted of him in life so that he wouldn't be afflicted again. In Israel, there is certainty, and there is certainty that arises from the reality. That is the one thing I'd like you to go away with. It's the well-known saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you go to Babylon, you don't get a saying, the fear of martyrdom is the beginning of wisdom. If you go into the Canaanites, uh, the remains of the Canaanite civilization, you don't get the fear of Baal is the beginning of wisdom. But in Israel, you get the unique truth that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's what these books are all about. If you turn to the book of Proverbs, That is, that nowadays, Proverbs are well received. We think of Proverbs as being rather simplistic things. In not, we, we would never try concluding an argument just by quoting a proverb. And people look and say, oh, here in the book of Proverbs you get these simple contrasts between the wise and the foolish, the righteous and the wicked, between conduct that leads to honour and conduct that leads to shame. And there are all sorts of shades of grey as well. And Proverbs suffers because we tend to view Proverbs as something old-fashioned something you don't use nowadays, and because we feel that the simplicity of a proverb leaves it less than satisfactory. Look at the politicians. Spend ages with their spin doctors getting the sound bite just right, simplifying a complex issue into a few memorable words. Or look at the ad men presenting a message in a slogan, an advertising slogan, a few words, and you can sometimes wonder what relationship they have to. We we'll use short, pithy sayings. But we have to be careful in analysing them. The politician with his soundbite is not saying, I've said everything there is to say about this subject. But he's saying, here is an interpretative key. Here is something that will give you a, a basic orientation in the matter. Remember this and you'll, you'll find your thinking going on the right lines. And that's what Proverbs provides us with. The Proverbs are really a series of short poems. Poems in, in balancing couplets. For the most part, it's just two lines, stating things one way and then the other. And the purpose of these proverbs is to emphasize the importance of making good choices, the importance of how living loyally to the Lord results in blessing. They don't try to approach all the issues at the one time. The compact language that is used, it does result in simplification, oversimplification. 
Every proverb has many exceptions. They generalize. And the people who wrote them down and recorded them, the wise men who were part of Solomon's court, the wise men who continued in the courts of the kings of Jerusalem, we know that some of the proverbs were collected later by the men of Hezekiah. They kept on preserving this wisdom literature. They knew that the proverbs were not saying everything that could be said. You know, just as we have contradictory proverbs, so do they. Many hands make light work, but too many cooks spoil the broth. And there's truth in both. But you have to have wisdom in the first place to know which is the one that applies to the situation that you're in. And so, for instance, in Proverbs chapter 26, you have verses 4 and 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Or again, in chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even-tempered. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. There you see somebody who doesn't say anything. Is he a wise man or a fool? Could be either. Could be a wise man using restraint, or a fool who's got a little glimmer of sense at last and doesn't show his folly. Now these are put down, many proverbs were put down like that. And it's not just that you can find one in chapter 8 that contradicts one in chapter 26. You find the contradictions right next to each other. Because Solomon, or the wise men who collected his proverbs later, knew that they were generalizations. They gave insight into life, but you couldn't apply them automatically. Can I put it this way? It's not permissible to take one verse out of the book of Proverbs and treat it. It's not possible to take it and make it absolute, because a proverb is never absolute. A proverb is a generalization. It's a challenge to our intellect. It says, here is an angle on truth. Here is an angle on human conduct. Think about this and see if it applies to the situation you have to face up to. A proverb is not in and of itself a promise that you can take and say, oh, this must apply. There is a fool who is talking nonsense. I must go up and challenge him. You have to say, there are times. So, proverbs are to be used with wisdom. But what picture is it that these proverbs present us with? I don't know if you know, the, you've heard of the, the commentator Derek Kidner, but uh, he's got a commentary on the book of Proverbs, and he's written very extensively in wisdom literature. A graphic way of putting things. And he put it this way, Proverbs is a book that seldom takes you to church. Like its own figure of wisdom, it calls to you across the street about some everyday matter or points out things at home. Its purpose in Scripture is to put godliness into working clothes. Putting godliness into working clothes. The challenge of living out a commitment to God in the detail, the mundane detail of everyday living. In Proverbs, there's no difference in the wisdom literature. Secular and sacred come together. It's not that you've got one compartment that's devoted to God and there's another compartment that's everyday life. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares at the head of the noisy streets. 
That's where she makes her appeal. Ivory Tower. The real problem of the suffering of a Job. Trying to work out where God's hand is in all the calamity that's come upon him. Trying to say, I know there's a God and yet I can't work out how he's operating in what I am undergoing. Wisdom literature is religion, commitment to God, dealing as the preacher in Ecclesiastes does. Grappling with the obscurities of what goes on in this world and making very clear the realization that if you try to understand this world under the sun, to use his favorite phrase, forgetting about God, if you try to understand this world forgetting about God, life becomes of futilities, inexplicable of inexplicabilities. You can't work it out. That's why at the end, he says, very much. Literature challenge. indoors. So often churches and religious groups focus inwards, they develop their own private language, they develop an attitude that's half contemptuous and half afraid of what's going on in the world out there. If you take wisdom literature, whether it's Proverbs or Job or Ecclesiastes or whatever, you're facing life. Out there. And when it looks at the situations of life, real life, not some ideal model of life, but life as it really is, wisdom finds its answer in terms That's what binds together religious ideas and religious practice in the Old Testament. It's the emphasis on the fear of the Lord that lifts what's said in the book of Proverbs out of the pagan secularism of the surrounding nations into true religious literature. And when it said it is the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't misunderstand that. It's not implying that a little bit later on, as you get wiser, you can discard the beginning. It's not saying it's the ABC in a day when you're no longer in primary. It's rather saying that it's the first and controlling principle that you can never get away from. The fear of the Lord is the foundational principle of wisdom that controls it all. And that fear is found throughout the whole of the Old Testament. That's how you link wisdom literature into the Old Testament. That's what God said to Abraham on Mount Moriah after uh, the um, time when he had bound Isaac to the altar. God said, uh, don't lay a hand on the lad because now I know that you fear God. Joseph in Egypt presented himself as one who feared God. The book of Exodus is a book about the fear of God. The fear of God at not some sort of numinous, some sort of unworldly awe, but the fear of God that comes right into ordinary lives. Starts off in Exodus 1 with the Egyptian midwives who wouldn't give in to a totalitarian state and the dictates of Pharaoh's dictator because they feared the Lord. And that carries through into the conduct of the Israelites at the time when they were at the Red Sea. 
the Israelites saw the great power that the Lord had displayed against the Egyptians, and they feared the Lord and put their trust in him. And that's what Moses said to them later on. Don't be afraid that God has come to you so that the fear of God will keep you from doing wrong. In every situation, in the situation at Sinai, in the situation in the perils of national crisis at the Exodus, in the situation of persecution, all these situations, the fear of the Lord as the guiding principle of life led to a right and a wise response. What you'll also find is that it's linked very often. Fearing God is talked about as being expressed in keeping his commands, walking with him, serving him, loving him, cleaving to him. It is religion worked out in life. And it is the key to the wisdom books. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And the same thought comes at the end. Book of Proverbs is a collection of a number of books. And the first collection ends at the end of chapter 9. And in the middle of chapter 9, at verse 10, you find again the conclusion. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And it's shown throughout the book of Proverbs that this fear of the Lord is divinely given. The Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding, Proverbs 2, 6. And that knowledge and understanding works itself out in hating evil. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. And those who hate evil and shun it are those who are presented as enjoying life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning an individual from the snares of death. But one of the wisdom literature doesn't talk much about God's future provision for his people. But there is one aspect of the other Old Testament revelation regarding God that is crucial. In that is where these thinkers, Solomon in particular, goes back to. The fact that God the Creator. That is what makes the whole world hang together. That is why the wise man who comes with a true reverence for God, a true reverence for God the Creator, can make sense of everything. If the whole of reality comes from the wise and all-sovereign Lord who's made and ordered all things, then there is meaning, there is structure, there is purpose, and one can find that out and live in accordance with it. All of life is God's because he is the creator. Hence that structure, that order in life that comes from God the creator, is in the doctrine of the two ways, the two paths. The use of a path or a road as a way of describing lifestyle is a very common feature of Old Testament language. The idea of there being two paths, and they're not going like that, they're going like that, two paths, shows that in life, choices have constantly to be made. We 
real life, choices have constantly to be made. The idea of walking down a path or travelling along a road occurs over 75 times in the book of Proverbs alone. And it is presented very much in terms of the two ways. It does this time and again, but can I read one of the passages to you? Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 to 19. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go your way. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know. All series of instructions focusing round two ways, the way of the wicked and the path of the righteous, and wisdom or folly is the character of the two paths. The choice is to be made, and once made, determines the destination. In that passage, there's a figure that I think we often perhaps talk to you about he stumbled as he came in the door. Losing their footing a bit. Not perhaps necessarily not being totally balanced for a while. It's something we perhaps do it every day. It certainly happens and we don't give it a second thought when you stumble. Well, it's, it's, it's not like You were dealing with a world where walking was the normal mode of travel, where walking often involved going through the wilderness area, where you'd be very much on your own. If you stumbled while walking on the wrong path, you were very liable to lose your life. It was life-threatening. In sparsely settled, lightly traveled regions, if you stumbled and injured yourself so that you could not yourself find a place, an injury, severe sprain, a broken bone, in those days would, lead, would be a death sentence. The picture of stumbling is much more threatening, I think, than we often take it. It's not something that can be easily recovered from, necessarily. It is entering into a situation where there are life-threatening consequences. Not only is going down one of them liable to lead to stumbling, and that stumbling in itself is potentially life-threatening, these paths we would call secular living. Turn to chapter 9. At the end of the first collection of the book of Proverbs, find there a description of, well, the commentators call her Lady Wisdom. Wisdom is personified as a lady and she has built her house, she's hewn out its seven pillars, she's prepared her feast, and in verse 3, she has sent out her maids and she calls from the highest 
point of the city. If you survey the cities of the ancient East, cities were built as fortresses to protect the temple of the god who was worshipped. And not merely was that temple often in the centre of the city, it was also at the high point of the city. That was true in Jerusalem. The temple was at the high point. And when wisdom is there presented as having this house and calling out from this house at the high point of the city, saying this wisdom is divine wisdom. Now look further on in the chapter. We then find the woman folly. Verse 13. She's loud. She's undisciplined and without knowledge. She sits at the door of her house. And where is it? On a seat at the highest point of the city. What is she claiming? She's also claiming to be divine. We're not here dealing uh, with um, just a lack of common sense when we're talking about folly. We're talking about a claim that in the ancient world is summing up the alluring voice of all the deities that thought to beguile Israel, be it the Baal of Canaan or the Asherah of Canaan or Marduk and Ishtar in Babylon. The two women and the two ways combined present a picture of a choice that doesn't just embrace conduct in the marketplace, but embraces ultimate religious decisions. In chapter 9, the reader is presented with a choice. Whose invitation will I accept? Will I accept that of Dame Wisdom or the Woman Folly? Synthesis is ruled out. There isn't a third option. It's one or the other. And what you're getting there in chapter 9 of Proverbs is the wisdom teacher, Solomon, presenting the same message as Elijah on Mount Carmel, the prophet. Message, but from people coming at life with two different backgrounds. Uh, the prophet Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and said, Choose you this day whom you will serve, the Lord or Baal. And the choice was presented, in Elijah's case, in stark terms. But what's being presented there in chapter 9 of Proverbs, and in the whole picture of the two paths with the two women, wisdom and folly, it's exactly the same message. It's not a different message. It says there are two paths. It's being presented in a more, shall we say, sophisticated it certainly came out of the language of Solomon's court. But it's saying, there is a challenge. And it's saying that to us still. It's not just saying there's the challenge of living in the real world, aware of God's demands. It's also saying that there are only ultimately two paths, the path of wisdom and the path of folly, both are making ultimate claims. Both are saying, we are divine. And the choice has still to be made. What then do we do with the other problem about Proverbs? I said it's simplistic. It's black and white without grey. And there is the phenomenon of dissonance which is when theory doesn't match reality. Writers of the book of Proverbs knew that there were times when 
things didn't work out as predicted. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 19. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of the wicked. There are times when their lifestyle may seem attractive. There are admonitions in Proverbs not to exploit or be unjust. Obviously, there is the possibility of that seeming attractive. Proverbs 24, verse 16, Though a righteous man falls seven times, the possibility is acknowledged that the righteous man won't always have things easy, although the promise is he will rise again. It must be admitted that Proverbs does not focus, doesn't make a big thing of, when things don't work out as expected. It presents us with a number of rules of thumb of life as you'd expect it to work out. But Job and Ecclesiastes, the other two main wisdom books, don't hesitate to grapple with the conundrums of life. In the book of Job, we journey to the very edge of pain and calamity. We see a man who's enduring failure without any explanation. Who's saying, why me? What have I done to deserve this? How can I work out why this is happening to me? And we're reminded, or to God, our human senses can apprehend. Somewhere, I forget where now, in connection with the argument of the book of Job, and especially the way in which God answers Job in chapters 38 to 41, I came across this quote. It was regarding the description of Behemoth, the animal, in chapter 40. As a mere argument, there's something lacking, perhaps, in saying to a man who's lost his money and his house and his family, and is sitting on the dustbin, covered all over with boils. Look at the hippopotamus. Really, that was saying, there isn't an answer in the book of Job. This person was saying, look, Job doesn't give an answer. The book doesn't give an answer. And what God says doesn't give an answer either. But that's to misunderstand. really saying when he says consider behemoth, consider so many of these features of the natural world, he's saying I'm the creator. You have to start your thinking about me with the realization that I have made it all. And then one of the key chapters in the book of Job is chapter 28. And how does chapter 28 end? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. What is being said there is not that God is going to explain all that's going on in the world, but that practical wisdom Wisdom that is able to go on living with life as it is, is wisdom that is always grounded in a right and reverential approach to God. The God who goes on to show himself as God the Creator, and who is thus able to challenge Job, and Job recognizes in chapter 42, that he has now seen something about God. Not the complete answer to his problems, but he's seen God's control, God's wisdom, God's power. And in that light, and it's the same thing with Ecclesiastes. The key verse in the book of Ecclesiastes I think is, uh, well, there's two key verses. The first is chapter 3, verse 11. He, that is God, has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. of God they want to work out what is going on around them we want to be able to piece together the facts and experiences of life we have that hankering we feel instinctively we feel that everything should make sense that's what motivates even the most atheistic of scientists. There is this assumption that if you look hard enough, you'll make sense of what can be found in the world. But if you look hard enough, those who are living before God. And so the end of the book, chapter 12, begins, remember your creator, back to that same thought again. And then we have the conclusion of the whole matter in verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments. The teacher, looking in the way he did at everything, could only say utter meaninglessness. But that was without God in the picture. He presents, it's a sermon that goes almost the whole way through, looking at things as bleakly as possible. And then just at the end, that is the way in which we have to realize what is going on. And that is the beginning of wisdom. How to work out living in this life in a way that does justice, not only to what we experience and what we find, but to the ultimate reality. And we can bring all this, and this is getting towards a conclusion, we can bring all this into an explicit New Testament context by noticing the association of Jesus with wisdom. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, when Paul talks about Christ and says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, he's using language that echoes Proverbs 8, where the picture of Lady Wisdom is presented. And in the next chapter, it just shows how it's in the back of his mind. In chapter 2, verse 3, uh, he speaks of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus himself used wisdom language. Not only did he often use proverbial sayings, his parables are drawn uh, from natural phenomena, but he justified his um, actions when his opponents were furious with him by saying wisdom is proved right by her actions, making the claim that he was God's wisdom. I'm not saying that Proverbs 8 is a prophecy of Christ. You can get into nice theological entanglements. Let's not get into heresy. Not, not, certainly not at the last, the conclusion of a talk. But Proverbs 8 sets up wisdom. That is in, lives in the highest place of the city. It is wisdom that ultimately reflects who God is and what God is. And we now find who God is and what God is portrayed for us in Jesus Christ not only as the one who embodies the source of wisdom, but as the one who also lives in accordance with that wisdom. He presents us with the same basic challenge that the figures of wisdom and folly in the two paths 
presented back in the With whom will we dine? With wisdom or with folly? With Christ, who is the ultimate expression of God's wisdom, or with whatever in our day and generation seeks to usurp the place that's rightfully his. Ultimately, wisdom literature is not a separate compartment of the Old Testament or separate compartment of Scripture that has concerns all of its own. It's ultimately got the same concern as the whole of Scripture. So it's coming at it from the special angle of the language of the wise men in Solomon's court who sought to understand life as it really was, who sought to give guidance, who were divinely led. Solomon was divinely given wisdom and understanding by God to provide very much of this guidance in proverbial terms. Others dealt with the problems of the inconsistencies of life and the frustrations of trying to understand what's going on in life. But ultimately, all these strands of wisdom focus in on the ultimate expression of God's wisdom in Christ. And they all present us with the same challenge. On whose path, whose house are we going, and what? Well, I hope that when you get the opportunity to mull over Proverbs, You'll not just take one verse and make that something that stands on its own. It's one, the verses, the parts of Proverbs have to be seen against that total background. Background that says all of life is God's because he is the creator. And the way to live coherently and consistently in the world is by recognizing and living in fear, true reverence for him. And in that way, one is on the path of life.